As I've learned even more since I've been here, Spurgeon is an, exa as an inexhaustible fountain of, of goodness and of submission to the Lord. A person who had great courage because he had great humility. And even the kinds of primary sources that, that have been uncovered even in recent days give confirmation of that and show that the work on Spurgeon really can never be complete because there is so much and there's so many different angles that we can take to the way he viewed various issues that were present in his own day that can inform us so much about our day. And it's with that intent that I make this presentation tonight. I'm to speak on Spurgeon in this session and my sessions tomorrow, uh, seeking to unpack something about his personal convictions about dealing with scripture uh, and about his uh, theological positions. And what I wanted to do tonight in this session is to make a presentation of convictions that were present very early in Spurgeon's life and to manifest how they continued to be present and matured and gave him strong conviction as to how he should handle difficulties that came later in his life. So I've entitled this, The, the Child is Father of the Man. I hope that also it will be an encouragement to those who are Sunday school teachers because you have a task of putting convictions and ideas and issues of authority and clarity uh, and truth in the minds of children which we can know from the testimony of the scripture passage that we read just a moment ago out of 2 Timothy 3 and as is demonstrated so often in the lives of God's people these bits of truth set so early in the conscience when the Spirit of God takes them to convert the person will work in such a way as to give them strong ministries, to give them a deep sense of conscience about living to the glory of God and will also fuel them in very practical ways as to how they carry on the work of God in this world. And so that is my, that's my application that I'm giving up front. Uh, a second application that I want to give up front, and then you can be thinking about it as we go through this, uh, is that uh, these lessons we have from Spurgeon should inform all of us when we have similar convictions that have come to us as to how they can work themselves out. If there are weaknesses that we find in Spurgeon, I think we can learn also how he was honest about his weaknesses and and use those and turn them into ways in which he could minister even more profoundly. So with those two words of application, uh, then I want to proceed with what I think will be beneficial as we look at the life of Spurgeon from these, this standpoint. There are, there are nine different areas that I want to look at, uh, and I'm aware that the program calls this a double session, uh, and that doesn't mean, though, that I'm going to take an hour and a half I'm going to try to get through in about 55 minutes here, but I hope that uh, the subject matter itself will be well worth uh, your listening to it. Number one, uh, Spurgeon, from very early in his life, interpreted all of the events of his life, all of his emotions, and all of his reactions in theological terms and looked at them within the context of providence. He saw everything in the light of a divine purpose. He measured his response externally and internally in light of biblical doctrine. One year after his baptism, he wrote his mother, reminding her that even the difficulties that had come to her as an adult were the result of the eternal covenant of grace and that she should not wish to reach, retrace any step. He said, mark the providences of this year. How clearly you have seen his hand in things which others esteem chance. God, who has moved the world, has exercised his own vast heart and thought for you. All your life, your spiritual life, all things have worked together for good. Nothing has gone wrong, for God has directed, controlled all. 
Spurgeon was quite aware of this in his own life. He had seen at the point of his conversion how God had prepared him for this, and he was able to point in his autobiography and in many other articles that he would write about particular things that had taken place in his life that prepared him for the reception of the gospel. He can say even the fact of being removed from his home at a very early age to go and live with his grandparents was a mark of God's providence. His parents were John and Eliza Jarvis Spurgeon. He was the first of 17 children, only eight of whom survived infancy. He went to live with his grandfather and his grandmother uh, and then for four years and he would go back frequently during the summer. And some of the things that he recalls while he was there that molded his life in the future. He remembers his grandfather's fellowship with the parish minister on Monday, a man named Mr. Hopkins, and he saw the, the joy they had with each other and how they would, they would share uh, bread with cinnamon and tea. And he became impressed at that time that those who held uh, vital truths in the, uh, in the same way could have fellowship in Christ, even though one was a part of the established church, one was, was a dissenter. There were things that transcended those kinds of natural, those kinds of uh, contrived barriers. He also remembers how earnest he had to be during the time of the sermon preparation. His grandmother would allow him to go and sit with his grandfather in his study. And later, his mother also would allow him to do the same thing with his father, but they, he was warned to be very, very quiet because there may be some important point that his grandfather was thinking about, and if he didn't get that point, it could mean the difference between heaven and hell and a person who might be hearing it. Now, of course, Spurgeon strongly believed in election, and he didn't believe that there was anything that was going to deter the, uh, the power and the grace of God in saving one of his sheep, but he also believed that a part of the way he did this was through the instruments that he called and that it was important to prepare and it was important to argue and that it was important to present as, as clearly a case as possible. And so he saw souls in the balance as he sat there in the study and had to be very quiet as his grandfather prepared. He also gained acquaintance with the Puritans. There was a room that was set aside for a library that had been given to the dissenting minister there. And he would go in and he would look at these books. And uh, even when he could not read, he nevertheless liked to feel them. And he said they, they went around like the old martyrs in sheepskins and goatskins. But he could enjoy pictures. And he had a, a volume of Pilgrim's Progress, an illustrated volume. And he would follow the story through and see Pilgrim in the various aspects of his journey toward the heavenly city. He also had Fox's Book of Martyrs and he became acquainted with old Bishop Bonner and the, the cruelty and arrogance he showed toward the Protestants and he learned to hate all repression and all persecution uh, even at that young age. And he learned to love the Puritans which was something that was a, a source of great joy and information and theological education for him throughout his life. It was there he met John Plowman. Now, John Plowman probably is the uh, combination of his own grandfather and a man in town named Will Richardson who had what they called crip sayings, a little short uh, sayings that would capture a truth or capture a characteristic of someone. And, and Spurgeon remembers how impressed he was with both his grandfather and with Will Richardson and the wisdom they had uh, in a very plain way of analyzing what was, what was happening in the town and what were certain characteristics of people. And so we see this coming out then in his own uh, personification of John Plowman and how many people have been delighted with that writing. Also there, he was challenged by his, his grandfather to kill as many rats as he could and was promised a penny for each rat that he would kill but his grandmother promised him a penny for each hymn that he would memorize. And so it was easier to kill rats than it was to memorize hymns, so Spurgeon very quickly learned that uh, the hardest, the hymn memorizing, would do him more long-term good than the killing of rats. And so he made it a lifelong practice of memorizing hymns. And anyone who's read Spurgeon's sermons, recognizing that just at any place in a sermon, he a word that he says or an idea that he is dealing with remind him of a hymn and he will, will quote a verse of a hymn and it's be apt and very appropriate for the point that he's making. One of the ones that he loved to quote most often was 
the great uh, hymn, Rock of Ages, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, run to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. And often he would quote just the first two lines of that. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And there would be three or four sermons in a row where he was preaching the gospel and he would quote that. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And one day he got an anonymous note from one of uh, his church members. It said, Mr. Spurgeon, we are fully convinced of the vacuity of your hands. Now could you please quote another hymn? Uh, he took it in a good-natured way and we do know the large numbers of hymns that he was able to quote as a result of that. He also loved another top lady hymn and quite often preaching on the atonement. He would quote the last two lines of, of this verse. If thou hast my discharge procured and fully in my room endured the whole of wrath divine, payment God cannot twice demand, first at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. It illustrated so well the certainty of God uh, and the economy of God in sending his son to save sinners. It was during this time also at his grandfather's home that the prophecy, the famous prophecy of Richard Neal was given. There have been some biographers who have minimized the importance of this, but it was not minimal at all in Spurgeon's estimation. He believed that there was something about it that was formative. It is probably at this time that Neal gave the prophecy that Spurgeon if in initially came under conviction of sin that lasted for five years before his conversion. But Neal was very impressed with him and would go in at 6 o'clock in the morning and get the young Spurgeon, would go uh, out with him and would talk to him and, and, and pray with him. Uh, Neil was on deputation from a, some sort of a children's evangelistic society and he would go around and he would raise money. He had also been a missionary and when he died, Spurgeon noted it in the sword and trowel and recalled uh, this event and uh, said that it was very meaningful to him. And he said that after he had begun, the, the, the prophecy was that when he began to preach, uh, he would one day preach in Roland Hill's chapel and he would sing, God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. And so Spurgeon, after he had begun to preach in London, was invited by a pastor named Dr. Alexander Fletcher to preach because he was taken ill. And so he was asked to come and preach uh, to the children at Surrey Chapel. He said, yes. If you will allow the children to sing, God moves in a mysterious way. I've made a promise long ago that that should be sung. And so it was. I preached in Roland Hill's chapel and the hymn was sung. My emotions on that occasion, he says, I cannot describe for the word of the Lord's servant was fulfilled. Still, I fancied that the Surrey was not the chapel which Mr. Neal intended. How was I to go to the country chapel? All unsought by me, the minister at Watton under edge, which was Mr. Hill's summer residence, invited me to preach there. I went again on the condition that the congregation should sing God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform, which was also done. To me, it was a very wonderful thing, and I no more understand today why the Lord should be so gracious to me. Well, all of these things had a formative influence on Spurgeon. He interpreted them as providences, Spurgeon said, the person who will mark providences will have more providences to mark. Learn to see God's activities, God's work in our life, even in the mundane things, day by day, how many different ways our paths have gone one way rather than another because a very simple thing, uh, and in a real sense, each one of those times of divine providence has made all the difference. The large providence, of course, was the one that led to his conversion in January the 6th, 1850. He was home from school. He intended to go with his father to his father's preaching, but a snowstorm came, and so his father didn't want to risk Spurgeon going with him, but Spurgeon wanted to go someplace to hear some preaching. He had been under conviction. He'd been struggling for five years. He needed to hear the word of God, and so as he walked through the st streets of Colchester, he found a Methodist chapel, a primitive Methodist chapel. Uh, Spurgeon tells his story in many ways, and there, there are different views that we get of of things that the minister said and different things that were happening inside Spurgeon's own emotions at the time. 
But in, in one of the most well-known of these versions that Spurgeon gives, he describes the situation this way. Uh, the minister was not able to be there, and so a common layman came up to preach. And he said uh, he was really a very ignorant man, and uh, he took as his text, the text that is look right here, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And he said the man could only go on about eight or nine minutes because he was ignorant and he could not make much out of his text. But it was exactly what Spurgeon needed to hear. And this is a version of the sermon. He said, do not look to the Father to know whether you're elected or not. You shall find that out afterwards. Look to me. Look to Christ. Do not look to God the Holy Spirit to know whether he has called you out or not. You shall discover that by and by. Look unto Jesus Christ. And then he want, went on in his own simple way to put it thus. Look unto me. I'm sweating great drops of blood for you. Look unto me. I am scourged and spit upon. I'm nailed on the cross. I die. I'm buried. I rise and ascend. I'm pleading before the Father's throne. And all this for you. The man looked under the gallery and said, Young man, you are very miserable. Spurgeon admitted that he was, but he was not accustomed to public remarks about it. <laughs> ah, and you will always be miserable if you don't do as my text tells you. That is, look to Christ. And Spurgeon said that he looked and he saw Christ and his heart was changed and all of his mournfulness was turned into a series of hallelujahs. The second thing that I want us to see in Spurgeon's life is not only that he interpreted his life in terms of, of providence, but his clear conviction concerning the doctrines of grace and God's covenantal pursuit of his people alone gave security to the tender Christian conscience and guaranteed a harvest of souls in evangelism. In 1850, the year that he was converted, he wrote to his father, Since last Thursday I have been unwell in body, but I may say that my soul has been almost in heaven. He went on to say that he had seen his title clear and knew that sooner than one of God's little ones shall perish, God himself will cease to be. Satan will conquer the king of kings and Jesus will no longer be the savior of the elect. If his father ordains doubts and fears, he will not dread to meet them, since even above the temporal doubts of his people, the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. This confidence of God's saving grace and God's determination to save his people had come to him in several different forms. He gives many images in which he describes this. And as he described the external situation by a, a providence, he also, in his sermons, would quite often describe the internal sense that he had of how God was pursuing him. In one of his messages, he describes the, the intensity of his fighting against the work of the Spirit and finally how he was conquered by the gospel. He says, Once I, like Mazeppa, bound on the wild horse of my lust, bound hand and foot, incapable of resistance, was galloping on with hell's wolves behind me, howling for my body and soul as their just and lawful prey. There came a mighty hand which stopped that wild horse, cut my bands, set me down, and brought me into liberty. Is there power, sir? Aye, there is power, and he who has felt it must acknowledge it. There was a time when I lived in the strong old castle of my sins and rested on my works, there came a trumpeter to the door and bade me open it. I, with anger, chid him from the porch and said he ne'er should enter. There came a goodly personage with loving countenance. His hands were marked with scars where nails were driven and his feet had nail prints too. He lifted up his cross using it as a hammer and at the first blow the gate of my prejudice shook. At the second it trembled more. At the third down it fell and in he came and said, Arise, stand upon thy feet for I have loved thee with an everlasting love. A thing of power. 
Ah, it is a thing of power. I have felt it here in this heart. I have the witness of the Spirit within, and I know it is a thing of might because it has conquered me. It has bowed me down. Very soon after his conversion, he heard someone else preach on 1 Corinthians 4, 7. And he reflected, surely I have nothing which I have not received. I can boast of no inherent righteousness. Had the Lord not chosen me, I should not have chosen him. The whole transaction of divine initiative never lost its glow for Spurgeon. Grace, 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 he said, is all of grace. I can do nothing. I am less than nothing. Yet what a difference. Once a slave of hell, now the son of, God, of the God of heaven. Help me to walk worthy of my lofty and exalted vocation. His abiding sense of divine sovereignty so engulfed his soul that he could not pass a day without some entry in his diary of energetic bursts of adoration of divine wisdom and mercy. His ability to apply these truths so gracefully and naturally in his preaching emerged out of the depth of his personal persuasion of their saving operation in his own case. He wrote, The Lord has visited me from on high. Rejoice, O my soul, leap for joy, renew thy strength, run, run in the name of the Lord. Then he wrote on May the 19th, Free grace, sovereign love, eternal security are my safeguards. What shall keep me from consecrating all to thee, even to the last drop of my blood? And then he asked on May the 25th, he confided to his diary on May the 29th, how happy am I to be one of his chosen, his elect, in whom his soul delighted. Make me thy faithful servant, O oh my God. May I honor thee in my day and generation and be consecrated forever to thy service. The next to the last day, uh, dated entry was on June the 19th, his birthday, when he noted that his true life had only begun at his conversion. My birthday. Sixteen years I have lived upon this earth and yet I'm only six months old. I'm very young in grace. Yet how much time have I wasted, dead in trespasses and sins, without life, without God in the world? What a mercy that I, that I did not perish in my sin. How glorious is my calling, how exalted my election, born of old, regenerate. Help me more than ever to walk worthy as becomes a saint. And then in an undated addition to this early diary, near the end of the manuscript, Spurgeon penned a prayer that distilled the nature of his pastoral ministry soon to be inaugurated. May I know the joy and have the faith of God's elect. May I rejoice in free sovereign grace, saving me from the guilt and power of sin. Grace is a glorious theme above the loftiest flights of the most soaring angel and of the most exalted conceptions of one of the joint heirs with Jesus. He closed the paragraph with a statement of the confidence that sustained him in the fulfillment of his closing request. All power is God's. All is engaged to protect and preserve me. Let me have my daily grace, peace and comfort, zeal and love, Give me some work and give me strength to do it to thy glory. Well, the third conviction that came to him early that he maintained throughout his life is being a Baptist. He records how when he was at school at Maidstone, he had a tutor that was Anglican. Anglican, this Anglican knowing that Spurgeon was from a dissenting family, began to seek to convince Spurgeon that he should join the Church of England because the Church of England had the true baptism. And he did it by comparing the way in which they did baptism. He says, you dissenters baptize infants, but you bring no sponsors to make a profession of faith for them. If you read the New Testament, you see that the New Testament always baptizes only those who have a profession of faith. We Anglicans have someone to make a profession of faith for the infant, therefore we have the true baptism. Well, Spurgeon thought about that a minute and said, it doesn't seem to me that your baptism meets the New Testament standard any better than mine does. And so I think I will make a resolution never to be baptized again or be baptized at all until I myself can make a profession of faith. And he would say later that he was a Baptist because of the Anglican Catechism. Well, in February, after he had been converted, he wrote to his mother, 
He says, conscience has convinced me that it is a duty to be buried with Christ in baptism, although I'm sure it constitutes no part of salvation. He began to write his letter to get permission from his father to be baptized. He wanted to make sure that his father was okay with this because Spurgeon had been baptized as an infant, this in a sense. Spurgeon was sensitive to it, knew that this would be a repudiation of a conviction that his father and his mother had, and so he was very solicitous of their permission in doing this. And in May of 1850, or before May of 1850, he wrote his mother saying, I have every morning looked for a letter from father. And making no attempt to hide his anxiety, he said, I long for an answer. It is now a month since I've had one from him. Do, if you please, send me either permission or refusal to be baptized. I've been kept in painful suspense. Well, the, the permission came, and uh, Spurgeon had the date for his baptism set by a Mr. Cantlow of Isleham, very famous event on May the 3rd, 1850. He walked to Isleham Ferry on the River Lark. The River Divide Suffolk from Cambridgeshire. There he was baptized along with two young ladies. The first baptism recorded at Isleham came in 1798 when Andrew Fuller baptized the father and his son and three others. The day of Spurgeon's baptism was cool. A gusty wind made elements of baptism startling and bracing. One of the aides had started a peat fire that people warmed themselves by and onlookers stood in boats on the ferry and on the bank. Spurgeon described this scene and the joy that he experienced at this. He says, the wind blew down the river with a cutting blast. As my turn came to wade into the flood, but after I'd walked a few steps and noted the people on the ferry boats and in boats on either shore, I felt as if heaven and earth and hell might all gaze upon me for I was not ashamed. There and then to own myself a follower of the Lamb. My timidity was washed away. It floated down the river into the sea, and it must have been devoured by the fishes, for I have never felt anything of the kind since. Baptism also loosed my tongue, and from that day it has never been quiet. I lost a thousand fears in the river lark and found that in keeping the commandments of God there is great reward. The story has been told often, but it bears repeating how that Spurgeon's mother remarked that she had prayed often that the Lord would convert her eldest son, but she did not request that he would become a Baptist. <laughs> and Spurgeon replied, Ah, mother, the Lord has answered your prayer with his usual bounty and given you exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or thought. <laughs> Fourth. Uh, Spurgeon did not like simply to, to criticize pastors, to criticize sermons, because he went to church and heard sermons in order to be edified by them and sought to seek everything from a sermon uh, that he could. But he was also not uh, unconscious of the fact that sometimes Scripture was misrepresented, uh, sometimes positions were taken that had uh, no foundation in the text. Uh, and so very early, he, while yearning for edification from the pulpit, he also gave close and critical observation to every aspect of the art of preaching. And as we all know, this continued throughout his life as he himself worked to master that God-called manner of proclamation and to teach others to do it. In April of 1850, again, just a few months after his conversion, he wrote his mother about the man that she heard preach regularly. He said, I often think of you poor starving creatures following for the bony rhetoric and oratory which he gives you. What a mercy that you are not dependent upon him for spiritual comfort. I hope you will soon give up following that empty cloud without rain, that type and shadow preacher, for I don't think there is much substance in it. In 1875, Spurgeon recalled, Before I had ever entered a pulpit, the thought had occurred to me that I should one day preach sermons which would be printed. Now, I'll say more about this tomorrow, but just briefly, the theory of Spurgeon's preaching uh, was, first of all, built upon a sense of its being something that was giving a mere human voice and a human mind the position of speaking the word of God. It was an awesome 
experience. Uh, early in his ministry, he tells about how he would have fits of sickness before every sermon. He would become faint. Sometimes he would vomit. And he had to get elders to, to help him stand. It was a very tremendously wrenching experience for him as he approached the time of preaching. He said, we have known what it is to totter on the pulpit steps under a sense that the chief of sinners should scarcely be allowed to preach to others. Later he says, preaching is a farce unless the minister has fire within him. But when the fire is there, preaching is God's ordained and guaranteed way of bringing souls to himself. It has been complained by some that Spurgeon was more of a topical preaching preacher or just selected texts and preached uh, extended doctrinal messages from them. But his personal conviction, of course, was expository preaching. And he considered himself an expository preacher. I think the reason that some people misunderstand Spurgeon's practice is they don't understand what the entire service was like uh, and they don't understand Spurgeon's theory about how the Bible all fits together. Uh, in every service, Spurgeon would have an extended scripture reading. If you look, in fact, if you look at the end of the, the sermons in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, it will always have at the end scripture read before the service. And it'll, it'll give the, the text that was read. And that text was one that provided opportunity for him to do a homily or an exposition. He would set it in context, he would read the text, and after one or two verses, he would make some brief comments upon that and then read another verse and make a brief comment. Sometimes it's just one sentence. Sometimes it may be four or five sentences. But the people would hear a long text read and they would, they would hear the flow of that and understand where it fit in the whole book and how all the verses related to each other. And then most frequently, his sermon would then arise out of one particular verse, out of that larger reading, or maybe one particular idea that was in that reading. And he would take that and expand that idea into a, a doctrinal application. And what Spurgeon was doing in this is he was teaching his people that the Bible has an immediate context and every verse has an immediate context. It must be seen in light of its entire narrative. And that's what he did in the exposition. But he was also teaching his people that the Bible in itself has a message that is coherent. It is consistent from beginning to end. And you can take a valid idea out of any uh, significant passage of Scripture, locate the doctrinal assumptions that are behind that text, and then preach that text in a, in a true and profitable way, showing how all the rest of Scripture and the doctrinal ideas of Scripture are focused upon that particular idea in that text. And so both of those things, his congregation was learning as he, uh, as he preached. Uh, I, I think that it is a practice that would be well done uh, today because these are, those are both things that we need to understand about uh, the scripture, the immediate application or the immediate context of the narrative as well as the doctrinal context. Uh, <clears throat> Spurgeon taught his young preachers to preach expository sermons. Uh, and in his commenting and commentaries very early in this, he placed himself as a third person uh, as a judicious critic of preaching, of contemporary preaching. And he said that such a critic would probably complain that many sermons are deficient in solid instruction, biblical exposition, and scriptural argument. Rather than fleshy, they are flashy. Rather than solid, they are clever. And rather than impressive, they are entertaining. Doctrine is barely discernible, and the brilliant harangues embody no soul food. This critic, Spurgeon says, if forthright and honest, would propose that homilies should flow out of texts and should consist of a clear explanation and an earnest enforcement of the truths which the texts distinctly teach. He would advocate expository preaching as the great need of the day and is most apt to protect against rising error while providing spiritual edification. The critic, Spurgeon himself, of course, would not unite in any indiscriminate censuring of hortatory addresses or of topical sermons, nor should we agree with the demand that every discourse should be limited to the range of its text. 
nor even, in some cases, that it should have a text at all. Now, by that, he didn't mean that it did not have truth as its foundation in any biblical text, but there are times in which an idea might be suggested by something else, and then it could be discussed in a biblical way. But nevertheless, he would continue to subscribe to the proposition that more expository preaching is greatly needed and that all preachers would be better if they were more able expounders of the inspired word. Now, it has been often said, and Spurgeon has often been criticized for a statement in which he says, uh, I find any text and I make a beeline to the cross. And people have used that to criticize him as having just sort of one message and not understanding things in context. But uh, that came out of a very thorough doctrinal understanding of the nature of divine revelation and the nature of God's purpose in the revelation of Scripture. And he explains how this Christ-centeredness, how he felt that true exposition was only consummated or could not been, has, has not been consummated if it did not find its final resting place in the cross of Christ. Spurgeon says, Our meditation upon it enlarges the mind, and as it opens to our soul in successive flashes of glory, we stand astonished at the profound wisdom manifest in it. Ah, dear friends, if you seek wisdom, you shall see it displayed in all of its greatness, not in the balancing of the clouds, not in the firmness of earth's foundations, not in the measured march of the armies of the sky, not in the perpetual motions of the waves of the sea, not in vegetation with all of its fairy forms of beauty, not in the animal with its marvelous tissue of nerve and vein and sinew, not even in man, that last and loftiest work of the Creator. But turn aside and see this great sight, an incarnate God upon a cross, a substitute atoning from mortal guilt, a sacrifice satisfying the vengeance of heaven and delivering the rebellious sinner. Here is essential wisdom, enthroned, crowned, glorified. Admire ye men of earth, if ye be not blind. And ye who glory in your learning, bend your heads in reverence and own that all your skill could not have devised a gospel at once so just to God and so safe to man. Well, the fifth issue that appears in Spurgeon very early and that was continued throughout his life is that he engaged in evangelism through any means that came to his hand. After he was converted, within a week or two, he was writing letters to his parents describing what had happened uh, to him, describing the joy that he had. And in one of his letters, he said, Oh, that the God of mercy would incline Archer's heart to him, that was his brother James, and make him a partaker of his grace. Ask him if he will believe me when I say that one drop of the pleasure of religion is worth 10,000 oceans of the pleasures of the unconverted. And then ask him if he is not willing to prove the fact by experience. I think I never felt so much earnestness after the souls of my fellow creatures as when I first loved the Savior's name. Spurgeon would make slips of paper and write scriptures on them and uh, would have 15 or 20 of these and as he walked down the street he would drop them out hoping that someone would pick them up and read the scripture and be uh, convicted. He was a part of a tract society and he would take these tracts and he had a certain number of people that he visited uh, as, a, as a student and he said he wrote his mother that he did not just go and give them the tract and walk away but he would give them the tract and sit down and explain it to them and seek to get them to understand the gospel by going through the tract uh, with them. Spurgeon was familiar with evangelism in the open fields. He loved to preach in the open fields. He was hoping that he could have the kind of physical perseverance that Whitfield did and spend part of his life uh, doing that all the time. Very soon his sickness overcame him and he could not do that open field preaching. He did evangelism in the streets. There's an article in the Sword and Trowel called Spurgeon Among the Costermongers uh, in which he witnesses out on the streets and preaches uh, in the places where all of these little small businesses were in, in London. And 
He gives his own preacher boys advice, advice about how to, be, how to do street preaching. And some of the uh, advice, of course, all of the advice there comes out of his own experience, and some of it is quite uh, hilarious, but quite uh, revealing and informative. And he organized the tabernacle for evangelistic purposes. Uh, he had 66 different organizations of benevolent activity that eventually found their home uh, here in the, in the tabernacle. And, and all of them were at some point uh, founded to seek to engage a certain segment of society so that the gospel might penetrate that segment of society. Virtually all of his sermons have an earnest evangelistic component to them, even those that are most polemical. They have as their concern the lack of any uh, uh, in any saving truth in any kind of perversion of the gospel. Even his sermons on purely Calvinistic themes are applied in ways to give evangelistic uh, emphases. A sermon on the atonement in which he emphasized the absolute effectuality of the atoning work of Christ was turned into an evangelistic appeal uh, at the end. He said, My poor faith is just as common as a bit of hyssop pulled up from the wall. But then I lay it a soak in the atonement. And while I muse upon who Jesus was and what he suffered and for what purpose, till it is wet, saturated, and all be crimsoned with the vital flood. Thus you crimson the lintel and the doorposts. Let all men know that whatever you may have been and whatever you now are, you do now believe in the substitutionary death of Jesus. Oppose you who may. Witness ye men and angels and devils that Jesus' blood is our sole hope. He who thus believes is saved. Brother, go your way and leap for joy. No man ever perished who from his heart rested in the atoning blood. When he was at Water Beach and he heard one of the deacons told him that a woman who had been regularly attending his preaching had been converted. And this was the per first person he heard of that had been converted through his preaching. And he was absolutely exhilarated. And he had the deacon to take him out. He wanted to talk to this woman to find out what it was that in the sermon or how the Lord had dealt with her. And so he, walked, he talked about this. And as he learned about it, he said, Then could I have sung the song of the Virgin Mary. For my soul did magnify the Lord for remembering my low estate and giving me the great honor to do a work for which all generations should call me blessed. For so I counted and still count the conversion of one soul. I would rather be the means of saving a soul from death than to be the greatest orator on earth. I would rather bring the poorest woman in the world to the feet of Jesus than I would be made the Archbishop of Canterbury. I would sooner pluck one single brand from the burning than explain all mysteries. To win a soul from going down into the pit is a more glorious achievement than to be crowned in the arena of theological controversy as Dr. Sufficientissimus. To have faithfully unveiled the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ will be in the final judgment accounted worthier service than to have solved the problems of the religious sphinx or to have cut the Gordian knot of apocalyptic difficulty. One of my happiest thoughts is that when I die, it shall be my privilege to enter into rest in the bosom of Christ, and I know that I shall not enjoy my heaven alone. Thousands are already there who have been drawn to Christ under my ministry. Oh, what a bliss it will be to fly to heaven and to have a multitude of converts before and behind and on entering the glory to be able to say, Here am I, Father, and the children thou has given me. Now, he didn't think that you became evangelistic by all of a sudden cutting short the doctrines that are in the Bible. He believed that all of these doctrines were evangelistic. All of them were central to the gospel. And so all of the doctrines could be used in such a way as to show people their need of Christ, to draw them to see the urgency of repentance and faith, and to show the certainty of the success of all who had faith in Christ in coming to forgiveness of sins. He says the sermons that are most likely to convert people are full of truth, truth about the fall, truth about the law, truth about human nature and its alienation from God, truth about Jesus Christ, truth about the Holy Spirit, truth about the everlasting Father, truth about the new birth, truth about obedience to God and how we learn it and all such great verities. And so this commitment to uh, preaching of the truth and applicatory preaching for the good of the souls of men is something that was developed early in Spurgeon's ministry. He carried it all the way through to the end. 
And six, he showed his tendency to sickness and despondency. <clears throat> in February of 1850, he wrote his mother that he had been in the miry slough of despond. He told her that his grandfather had sought to bolster his spirits, but is that what I want, he said? Ought I not rather to be reproved for my deadness and coldness? He prayed, heard, and read without doing any of them heartily, but in deadness and coldness. When he recovered from this bout of despondency, he described the extreme depth of it as well as the remedy to escape it, a remedy that remained with him throughout his ministry. In the blackest darkness, I resolved that if I never had another ray of comfort, and even if I was everlastingly lost, yet I would love Jesus and endeavor to run in the way of his commandments. And from that time, I was enabled thus to resolve all these clouds have been fled. Well, the <clears throat> struggle that Spurgeon had both with his health and with despondency is quite well known. Uh, the Suffering Letters is a book that has been pres uh, uh, published by Wakeman Press uh, and is really well worth your, your having because it shows how Spurgeon was open about this to his congregation and how he wrote them and how he explained the Lord's ministry to him even in these times of, of sickness and distress. In 1885, <clears throat> he explained to his readers why they should not expect much scintillating from his pen in the preface to the sword and trial. Well, he said, every limb of my body is tormented with pain. There is about as much pain in each limb as any one of them can conveniently bear. Not only so was it with the body, but he said the mind-body unit was in a state of fidgets, malaise, and depression. Could someone be chained in his place, he said, he would gladly yield. But since none is handy, we must tug the oar even if we snap our bones. And after two paragraphs, Spurgeon had to put down the pen, for he was interrupted by what he called a hurricane consisting of rushes of pain and twitches and all sorts of deadly apprehensions and only continued later by dictating to an amanuensis. Brain weariness has driven the pastor to take his accustomed rest. The delay in going brought about the, the painful attack, caused not so much by a recurrence of the disease as by general weariness. On December the 17th of that year, he described a balmy day of clear sunshine and summer warmth in Mentone. He could sit outside all day and drink in the healing influence of the sun, the sea, and the air. There is nothing like it for an invalid to whom the cold and the damp are killing. He hopes soon to be on his feet with a refreshed brain and full of work again. Seventh, <clears throat> I'll move quickly through these. He had a propensity for self-analysis that resulted in universalizing his personal experience as a canon of judgment in a variety of situations. He recognizes this propensity to talk about himself and to analyze himself. Very early, he had written a letter, and, he, and then he's, he caught himself about two-thirds of the way through it, and so he began to write this. So he, he, he keeps talking all about himself, he acknowledged in the letter. True, he does. He cannot help it. Self is too much his master. I'm proud of my own ignorance, and like a toad, bloated with my own venomous pride, proud of what I've not got, and boasting when I should be bemoaning. Well, whether sinful or mere spiritual transparency, one must become accustomed to Spurgeon on Spurgeon. But this was something that he transferred into a deep analysis of his own experience, analyzing it according to scriptural categories, and he was able to deal sympathetically with other people because he was so in touch with the way truth impacted his own mind. He does this in recommendation of books. He does this in, in his analysis of the contemporary situation. And there's, there's one particular uh, personal battle that he had that he analyzed, that he uh, uses to seek to warn all of his people against engaging in much of the contemporary issues of, of free thought, advanced thought. He said that he had already done that. He had already dealt with that. He had already worked through all of that himself. And they should take his word for it that there was nothing there but complete destruction. In the Sermon on the Bible, he said, There may be someone here tonight who has come without faith, a man of reason or a free thinker, 
With him I have no argument at all. I profess not to stand here as a controversialist, but a preacher of things that I know and feel. But I too have been like him. There was an evil hour when once I slipped the anchor of my faith. I cut the cable of my belief. I no longer moored myself hard by the coasts of revelation. I allowed my vessel to drift before the wind. I said to reason, be thou my captain. I said to my own brain, be thou my rudder. And I started on my mad voyage. Thank God it is all over now. But I will tell you its brief history. It was one hurried sailing over the tempestuous ocean of free thought. I went on and hurried sailing over the, uh, uh, the skies began to darken. But to make up for that deficiency, the waters were brilliant with coruscations of brilliancy. I saw sparks flying upwards that pleased me. And I thought, if this be free thought, it is a happy thing. My thoughts seemed gems, and I scattered stars with both my hands. But anon, instead of these coruscations of glory, I saw grim fiends, fierce and horrible, start up from the waters. And as I dashed on, they gnashed their teeth and grinned upon me. They seized the prow of my ship and dragged me on, while I in part gloried at the rapidity of the motion, yet shuddered at the terrific rate with which I passed the old landmarks of my faith. As I hurried forward with an awful speed, I began to doubt my very existence. I doubted if there were a world. I doubted if there were such a thing as myself. I went to the very verge of the dreary realms of unbelief. I went to the very bottom of the sea of infidelity. I doubted everything. But here, the devil foiled himself. For the very extravagance of the doubt proved its absurdity. Just when I saw the bottom of that sea, there came a voice which said, and can this doubt be true? At this very thought I awoke. I started from that death dream, which God knows might have damned my soul and ruined my body. If I had not awoke, when I arose, faith took the helm. From that moment, I doubted not. He would talk about elements of assurance of salvation. He would use his personal testimony and speaking with people in an evangelistic way. He would, he would look at their own experience in light of his and he could uh, empathize with them in the various struggles that they had. Uh, and so he turned this focus on himself, this self-analysis into something that he could use <clears throat> for ministry. Well, eighth, he committed himself to a position of no compromise with the destructive influence of modern thought, 19th century liberalism. In November of 1850, he wrote his aunt and uncle, let the whole earth and even God's professing people cast out my name as evil. My Lord and master, he will not. I glory in the distinguishing grace of God and will not by the grace of God step one inch from my principles or think of adhering to the present fashionable sort of religion. <clears throat> well, 37 years later, his convictions had not changed. His resolve on these matters became the spark that ignited the downgrade controversy. He maintained, in spite of all opposition, in spite of the loss of friends, he maintained the central issues of doctrine uh, and proved himself uh, to be something of a lone champion for truth in that day. But as he himself predicted, the years have shown that he was right in his analysis of what would happen to those who took the road of advanced thought and he was also right in the fact that God would vindicate his own truth and would reassert the reality and the power of the gospel in decades to come. <clears throat> and then finally, ninth, his commitment to scripture remained the final touchstone in all these other traits and created a habit of independence of judgment that was startling refreshing, maddening, perplexing, and enraging to his contemporary churchmen and Christian thinkers. <clears throat> he says, one that dared dismiss scripture as erroneous in any part, not only attacked the veracity and the reign of God, but slid his own throat, leaving himself without light from above to guide into the treacherous shoals of death, regnant with the wrath of God apart from a ransom to which scripture alone bears witness. It is the book that God wrote, and to deny it is to charge God with error. Spurgeon felt fully warranted to proclaim, this is the book untainted by any error. 
but like its author was pure, unalloyed, perfect truth. Thus his own judgment was, was freed from the oppressiveness of human opinion and the shifting theologies of modern thought or even the inherited traditional theologies of the past. In a, an article in the Sword and Trowel called Remarks on Inspiration, he said that the turning point of the battles of those who hold the faith once delivered to the saints and their opponents lies in the true and real inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. This is the Thermopylae of Christendom. If we have in the Word of God no infallible standard of truth, we are at sea without a compass. We must part company altogether with the errorist who overrides prophets and apostles and practically regards his own inspiration as superior to theirs. Uh, he was accused, along with others who held to the inerrancy of Scripture, of bibliolatry. He commented that these would be the last persons to worship anything other than God, but they did see this God that they adore as the author of that book, and this is a God who makes no errors. Early in his ministry, as he's preaching to the open fields, <clears throat> thousands of people are there. He's defending the word of God before them. He says, there's nothing in God's Bible which is not great. Did any of you ever sit down to see which was the purest religion? Oh, you say, we never took the trouble. We just went where our father and mother went. Ah, that is a profound reason indeed. You went where your father and mother did. I thought you were sensible people. I didn't think you went where other people pulled you, but went of your own selves. I love my parents above all that breathe, and the very thought that they believe a thing to be true helps me to think it is correct. But I have not followed them. I belong to a different denomination, and I thank God that I do. I can receive them as Christian brothers and sisters, but I never thought that because they happened to be one thing, I was to be the same thing. No such thing. God gave me brains, and I will use them. And if you have any intellect, use it too. Never say... It doesn't matter. It does matter. Whatever God has put here is of eminent importance. He would not have written the thing that was indifferent. Whatever is here is of some value. Therefore, search all questions. Try all by the word of God. I am not afraid to have what I preach tried by this Bible. Only give me a fair field and no favor and this Bible. If I say anything contrary to it, I will withdraw it the next Sunday. By this I stand, by this I fall, search and see, but don't say it does not matter. If God says a thing, it must always be important. And may we so believe.